Hi, ladies. I'm so excited to celebrate alongside you during book launch week. I'm grateful to have been able to be on your launch team and read the book early. I wanted to share with you an experience I had this weekend with my mom that was greatly improved by learning from your work. My mom and I disagree fundamentally on a large variety of issues, mostly as a result of my own shifting in beliefs over the past decade, a combination of growing up and learning more and the national shift in politics from the right. Despite several difficulties in our relationship, it's been a priority to maintain a relationship with my kid's only grandmother. This weekend, my family was visiting my parents and generally steered clear of political discussions, but at one point, she made a comment about how nobody wants to work anymore. My dad chimes in with, because of all these damn government handouts. I won't give you the play-by-play, but suffice it to say that I was really proud about how I was able to have the conversation and lead with my values. To share that I see the situation differently than they do, but that we don't have to agree. That I'd prefer for people who need help to get it than for no one to be able to take advantage of the system. But ultimately, we were able to have a less heated political discussion while respecting each other's boundaries and hopefully understanding each other's views more clearly. I wouldn't have been able to have this conversation without the influence of your work, your books, and your podcasts. So thank you for sharing what you've learned with kindness. Have the best book launch week available to you. Allie. This is Sarah Stewart Holland. And this is Beth Silvers. Thank you for joining us for Pantsu Politics. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Pantsu Politics. It is a big day here. It is the launch of our book, Now What? How to Move Forward When We're Divided About Basically Everything. Now, listen, we have been eating, breathing, sleeping this book for months. Maybe you haven't. That's fine. But today, today you must eat, breathe, sleep it because it is the launch day. Now, we are having our launch party tonight. We're going to answer questions. I'm going to share a 90s country playlist that I have poured my soul into. Y'all, it has a story arc. The playlist has a story arc. There is love. There is loss. um, There is redemption. I'm really proud of it. I'm using the word playlist loosely because it is six hours long, but you're going to love it. Now, if you are not listening to this episode the day it comes out, how dare you? (laughs) Because we are kind and generous people. Uh, We're going to extend the deadline. So if you buy the book this week at all, fill out the form on our website that's linked in the show notes, and you can claim your pre-order bonus, and we'll just send you a recording of our party tonight and the country playlist. So get excited. Well, in addition to celebrating with all of you tonight and via the odyssey of country music that Sarah has compiled for all of us, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. we have also chosen to have the most special conversation about our book today with a longtime listener of the show, good friend who we've had the opportunity to meet in person several times. We've hung out in a hot tub. Important trivia. That is not what I would have added to his bio. (laughs) But thank you, Sarah. Um, Please welcome Fred Deuce to the show. Fred's official work life is also quite impressive. He is a multimedia project manager at the Brookings Institution and an interviewer extraordinaire. But he's here today as our friend and as someone who has read Now What as part of our launch team and the person that we thought could best help us talk through why this book might be interesting to you, what we were doing when we wrote it, and and now what for now what. So, Fred, thank you so much for joining thank us. Thank you, Fred. Well, you're welcome, and thank you both so much for inviting me to talk with you about your amazing new book. Uh, Sarah, I'm glad you mentioned the hot tub incident. Uh, but <laughs> all my say incident, Fred. That makes it more exciting than it was. <laughs> um, there were other people there. But I, I just want to say I've en- I enjoy all the times I get to spend with both of you uh, here in Washington, D.C., uh, or at various podcast movement conferences, like where I met you guys in 2016 in Chicago. 2016. Uh, and I've watched you grow this podcast, grow this community over the past uh, six years, and it's been impressive to watch, but also because it's the voices that I think we need in our in our country right now. And this book uh, adds to that in a marvelous way. So I want to say congratulations to you both on the publication of your second book. Thank mm. you so much. 
Thank you. Thank you so much. Permit me, if I can, to ask you some questions about this book, Now What? How to Move Forward When We're Divided About Basically Everything. I want to know, what are your feelings uh, on publishing the book, especially compared to when you published your first book? I think you're wrong, but I'm listening three years ago. And and perhaps more broadly, how do these two books complement each other? I feel very differently about the publication of Now What than I felt about I Think You're Wrong, But I'm Listening. We wrote I Think You're Wrong in a context that by the time the book was published felt very different. I'm very proud of what's in that book. I still think it has lots of helpful advice. It is certainly a great starting place if you are entering political conversations without having done some work on yourself, kind of thinking through, where am I? Why am I here? Where do I want to be next? I feel so different about this book because I think it meets the moment. I don't feel like we wrote the book and then the world went upside down and we published it. I feel like this book was written uh, with a really clear understanding of where we are and how we can move forward together. Um, It's right there in the title, but it really does apply. You know, I, I think what we've said here is, okay, you've done your personal work and it's still very, very hard. So what's next in your relationships what matters to you. And it's not a prescriptive book. You know, it's a book where we're just inviting you to think with us because we don't have all the answers here, uh, but we have some questions that we hope help people get unstuck. I'm really excited about this book. I was really excited about the first book. I love the process of writing books. I know it's, it's hard and it's emotional, but I love the permanency. I even love the way it sort of, you know, catches you at a moment in time and sticks you there. I think that's good for you. I think it's good to sort of mark where you were and remember and have that that moment of, oh, I don't feel that way anymore. Or I've um, sort of moved past that that place. I just, I think that's good for us to remember that, to remember like that's how I felt about that and I don't feel that way anymore, to remember to sort of mark the growth. And I'm sure that that will be true of this book um, eventually. But I, I love that process and I love of sort of having to to clarify and and put it in a place and know it's going to stay there. And, you know, this book is much more personal than our first book. There's a lot more personal stories in this book um, that I really enjoyed sharing and writing about. And I hope that people sort of feel that they care in sharing our stories and trying to say, like, we know this is hard. This is where we've been through it. Instead of that sort of, you know, instructional tone, I think that's sort of the complimentary aspect of the two books. I think the first one, we were really just trying to say, like, here's what we've learned. Here's sort of the the steps and processes we can recommend. Whereas this book, I feel like it's it's more invitational. It's like, let us invite you along for what we, along this journey we've walked and try to give you as much empathy and care and just that sense of like, you are not alone. Other people are in this with you. I will say that that's one of the, best parts about what the two of you have been doing over the past seven years is taking us on a journey with you Mm -hmm. uh, in conversation and relationship. Uh, And this book certainly uh, does that. So let's dive into the book and go through some of your ideas in some more detail. And there's so many great ideas. We can't cover them all in the time we have. But I want to talk about uh, one thing in particular, and that's what I think is a call for people to engage or re-engage as citizens of this country and ultimately of the world. Is that a fair reading? Absolutely. And I like that you pulled that out uh, to to mean more than just the country, because I do hope that the book is a call to be active in every space that you're in. And sometimes that's smaller than being a citizen of the United States or even of your community. Uh, and sometimes it's much larger. So I, I love that characterization. Well, and I think that reflects the journey the show has been on. I think when we started, we were really engaged in the national political scene. And we, it's not that we aren't anymore, but I think that we try to engage as citizens. And when you engage at one level as a citizen through that lens, it infects all the other levels. And I think that's really what we're trying to pull apart in this book, too, is to say, like, there's not one answer because these levels of connection are so different. Are you talking about conversations you're having with your parents? Are you talking about how you feel about global climate change? Like, the we have to sort of pull those threads apart um, and see 
what differentiates them and what connects them. What's the same, right? That's what happens when you start thinking about yourself as a citizen of the United States. Then you realize, well, I'm also a citizen of my county. Um, when my when my husband or partner and I talk, we're also talking as citizens together. And I think sort of figuring out those th- that connective tissue and also that the separateness of those spaces is really what we're trying to to walk through in this book. Well, the the book itself is a journey through those different levels of connection. You do start with our families of origin. You have the families we create. You have our workplaces and you have our local communities. And the circle keeps widening out into our larger communities, how we interact with government, how we interact with the world. Uh, And so it feels like not only a call to re-engage as citizens, but just a call to connect despite our differences on all these different levels. Well, and I hope what people do is develop the skills to see those connections. Because you talk about, you know, a controversial political issue, and it just, we have a tendency to reduce it, right? It just becomes black and white. It becomes very, a, a very two-dimensional thing. And I hope what people learn is not that there's just like one formula for parents and one formula for national politics, but that those, these when we can see these sort of concentric circles, when we can see the different ways we interact with each other, we can also see that the skills that I might use in a conversation, um, even on Facebook, could be helpful in a conversation or a context that I need in my workplace, right? To, to sort of cross-purpose those skills and see those differing levels of connection is I think it takes the pressure off when you realize like, oh, I don't, The reason this is hard is something to do specifically with this space, not because everything's broken, not because I'm bad, not because, you know, all is lost, but because this is this space, this this particular level of connection presents its own unique challenges. And paradoxically, some of the skills I learned over here are applicable in this space. And I think the flip side of releasing some pressure, which I really hope the book does, is also making us see that. Because we are showing up as a citizen in some format of our families, of our workplaces, of our world, uh, we don't just get to float in existence in any of these spaces. Even on social media, being there makes a difference. And Mm -hmm. when you just exist in a space, uh, you don't get to decide what kind of difference it makes. And so I hope that by really intentionally seeing ourselves as citizens of all these different spaces, we can intentionally commit to making positive contributions in the spaces. Let's turn for a moment to one of those levels of connection, and that's families of origin. Uh, You note in the book that you get more email about navigating political conflict within families than on any other topic. Uh, And that was largely the focus of your first book. I think you're wrong, but I'm listening. In Now What, you write, and I'll quote, instead of trying to fix the partisan divides in our families, we are working to try to see them better. What do you mean by see them better? I think when we don't approach them as a problem, but just a reality of humans gathering, especially humans with a lot of shared history and shared stakes and shared realities, that we realize that there's a lot of, there's a lot at work here. Again, we we shrink them down, right? We say like that they're wrong, they're crazy, they're selfish. I'm right. And what we're really trying to say is, I mean, that that's listen, that still might be true at the same at the end of this process. Maybe there is some selfishness there. But what's informing that, right? Like where where is that coming from? Um, because there's no connection, there's no healing, and there's such loneliness. That's what we hear from people in all these messages. There's such loneliness when I just decide I can't connect with you on this anymore. Because I think we carry this, and I don't think it's always true, but I think we carry a narrative that, like, these are the people that we're supposed to be the closest to. And, look, well, for a lot of reasons, that's not true in every family, and it shouldn't be true because of, you know, toxicity or trauma or abuse. But I think we carry this if it, if those things aren't present and we're still disconnected, especially from our families of origin, especially over politics, we carry this this the sadness, like we've done something wrong, like we failed at something. And sort of just saying that out loud and speaking through these complexities and realizing like there's not something wrong with you, there's not something wrong with them. What we're doing here is hard. The reason it's coming up in every family is because there's some universality to that hardness, that difficulty. Um, and there, there is 
an ease, an easing up when you can just name it and you can just be curious and examine it instead of trying to either fix it or compartmentalize it and push it away. Yeah, I think that political conflict gets scapegoated in a lot of relationships right now. It's Mm -hmm. treated as both cause and effect, as something that just came down and hit our families like an asteroid maybe during the 2016 election. And that's clearly not the case. If you can't Mm -hmm. talk with your dad, your uncle, your sister about an election, I'm certain there are other topics that create a lot of conflict between you as well. And so where are those coming from? Why are they happening? What do they tell us about each other? I'll give you an example of this that I can't stop thinking about. You know that we're reading Colin Woodard's American Nations and using it to help us think about the midterm elections. And I keep thinking about the section where he's talking about Greater Appalachia and how many people in Greater Appalachia are likely to just list American as their only heritage, that so many people in this region do not know their family families' origin stories, their families' histories, where they came from, what culture really sits behind them before they lived in this country. Well, when you start to think about that, of course, critical race theory or Black Lives Matter or multiculturalism in general, diversity, equity, inclusion initiatives are hitting a nerve here. And, and situating it in that kind of context within your family, okay, this, this has struck me as something that my beloved relative is obsessed with and I don't understand why. What do we know about ourselves that we can start stripping away to better understand why we're having this fight instead of just doing the fight over and over again? Well, let's stick on that uh, personal note for a minute. Uh, Sarah, you talked about how this book is more personal than your first one. Uh, Throughout the book, there's lots of vignettes from both of you um, sharing very personal stories. Sarah, you talked about being an eighth generation Kentuckian so I wondered if you could talk more about why you chose to to put those very personal anecdotes uh, throughout the book. When we started writing this book, we intended to tell a lot of stories because I do think a lot of this political conflict lives in the stories. And we began writing other people's stories. We interviewed some listeners. We kind of crowdsourced a lot of uh, the the problems, the things that people were navigating because we really wanted this book to be immediately and practically useful to readers. But then as we were writing, uh, we just realized something about this feels wrong because you can't tell other people's stories as effectively as you can tell your own. And part of the problem in politics is that many of us are always trying to speak for other people. And so uh, we we scrapped where we were and started again and said, let's make this book about us and about what we know and what we see and what we're living all the time. Uh, and invite other people into this through the lens of of our stories, hopefully in ways that encourage and invite them to tell more of their own. And I want to say, though, that all those stories listeners shared really informed how this book was structured, the problems we were trying to solve. Like, we ended up not, not sharing the individual stories, but the stories helped write the book, you know, because it it really illuminated for us like what what are the common themes among what people are struggling with and look that it's not an accident they were the themes in our lives too that's why the stories that we share worked right is because um not because they're just some sort of unique solution to what how we fixed it in our lives but because we struggle with the same things um that everybody struggles with and so being able to say which is what we want this book to do which is we you're not alone this is not you know a personal failing um, or just an individual issue. Like, this is something that's happening to people across the country. Well, those stories also help the reader go on the journey with you, which is really what happens on, on your podcast and in your speaking engagements overall. And and, and I want to stay on this for another minute. You each have children, and you have a section called Raising Citizens, section in the book called Raising Citizens. Could you each talk about um, your approach, your different approaches that you take to transmitting political messages to your children. Yeah, we take very different approaches because, you know, as regular listeners know, I have three boys and Beth has two girls. And so for me, what I really want them to understand is that, you know, women's voices are normal inside political conversations. I don't want them to to see that as, you know, sort of a a dog walking on its hind legs, you know. Um, And so I want them to develop the skill of listening inside a political conversation. I want them to develop the skill of 
allowing particularly a woman to have a forceful opinion. And so I don't, you know, I don't mind articulating my opinion to them. I'm not worried about my, you know, my three little white boys being bullied into not having opinions of their own. Like the world is going to do a fine job of telling them like, what do you think about this? And so I want them to hear what I think about it. <laughs> and so then we have a conversation from them. It's not like I shame them into my op- opinions, but I I put them out there pretty forcefully because I want them to develop the skill of listening to that and understanding there's like nothing abnormal and perfectly acceptable about it. And then it may be using these opinions they hear from people different from themselves to inform their own opinions. My parenting is different. I think that it is because I have two girls. I also think that some of this is a function of our personalities and styles, which which are always going to take us on different paths. When my girls want to talk about an issue, I really first try to just help them understand what we're even talking about. So if it's a foreign policy issue, I get out the globe. Where are we talking about in the world? Uh, if it's some if they heard on the bus, you know, somebody saying, oh, Joe Biden eats babies. OK, well, where did they get that? What, you know, why are we talking about this? Where might they have heard that? And then once I kind of lay that foundation, I'll let it sit for a minute. And if they seem interested in continuing to talk, because, you know, kids' attention goes all over the place and letting them lead is really important to me. But if they want to keep going, I'll say, well, what do you think about this now that I've told you a little more? And sometimes they'll ask a question or develop an opinion. and, And I ultimately do share with them how I see things. But I am very curious about once we've once we've established what we're talking about, uh, where they want to go with it. And often they take it and make connections that are uh, really profound and teach me something. And I try to say that back to them. Wow, you just really taught me something. I never would have connected these two things. Um, so it's a it's a really rewarding process. I think it's one of the most fun parts of being a parent. Oh, I agree. Uh, as a parent myself, I'm a parent of a teen. And so those conversations, just get, <laughs> they <laughs> just get deeper and they actually get more complicated and, to be honest, more challenging uh, for me personally to try to see the world through my my teen's eyes. Uh, well, I'm going to I'm going to quote one more time, at least one more time, because I love to quote from your book. I have <laughs> I have five pages. of. I love to hear myself quoted. Fred, uh, thanks. <laughs> I have five pages of quotes from your book. I could just read them all. Actually, you should read Aww. them all. But let me let me read this quote and ask you both to unpack uh, what's going on here. And again, it's about raising citizens. Citizenship is a group activity. So raising citizens cannot be a solo endeavor. We read a lot of research that informed this part of the book. Uh, you know, it, it is not a heavily footnoted book. We did not want to make this an academic work. We really wanted it to be fun and to feel good and to feel like it had a sense of lightness and ease. Uh, but we did a lot of research. And scholar after scholar, uh, policy analyst after policy analyst will tell you exactly what Senator Elizabeth Warren says often, when, and we quote her in the book, that uh, we just need help. <laughs> we we need help um, shepherding people through the world at all ages, and especially when we have children. Children need adults in their lives who are not their parents, loving adults who they trust. They need people to admire. They need to see lots of different ways of being in the world, lots of different ways to create a family, to create a rewarding life. And I think all of us need someone to release that pressure and to say, yes, ask the people down the street to watch your kids say, I cannot possibly cook dinner tonight. Can you help me? Invite a friend to have a conversation with a child about something that you're struggling to talk with them about. Um, I don't know exactly why and how, even after all the reading that I've done, that we got to this point in in many parts of America, especially in, in many parts of like uh, middle-class white America, where we believe that we have to raise our nuclear families alone. But I think there is uh, much to learn from from the cultures that for centuries have raised children in community and that, that that's a that's a direction uh, that all of us need and I think on some level are craving. I would just like to know how one raises a citizen of a multicultural democracy with over 300 million people with one perspective. <laughs> How would that even work? <laughs> like, to, to, to raise a citizen in America in the 21st century and think like, you know best and you're going to do it alone. Or And I don't think it's that people, well, I think some people believe that as if they, they have to implant the cro- proper way into their children. We see that in the school fights. We see that in the curriculum fights. Um, 
bless those people. I almost feel sorry for them. Um, Almost. But I think some of us f- don't feel it as like, I have to, but like, they feel like like a responsibility, like a duty. Um, they feel this like pressure and guilt that they have to impart this, this, you know, perfect perspective as they raise citizens in America in the 21st century. And I just want to say like, pump the brakes. You're not by yourself. Also, kids don't do what you say. They do what you show them. And so, you know, showing them that citizenship is an exchange, right? That it's going out there, it's trying something, realizing it wasn't for you. It's letting yourself be worked on and community boards and volunteer positions and being frustrated with politicians and also speaking about them like they're still whole and complete human beings. Um, And I think just teaching kids that, like, we're all trying to figure this out. And you're going to be a part of that. You're already a part of that. Um, I think that's the best thing that we can give our kids and realize, like, we don't have to hold all that. And, you know, I I think that's part of how we think about parenting. I wrote a blog post a long time ago that was like, I'm not an expert in my own kid. That's too much pressure. This idea of, like, well, I know my kid best. I mean, do you? Like, I don't know. Like, my kid's a newly diagnosed type 1 diabetic. Believe I don't know my kid best right now. Believe that there are experts in diabetes that understand um, what's going on in Felix's body way better than I do. Um, And so I just, because I think that just creates so much pressure, and I think we do that in politics, and we do that in education, and we do that in so many ways. Um, You know, and it's like a little Dr. Phil moment. Like, how's that working for us, America? Are, like, we happy with the results? Let's pivot now to the second half of the book. You have focused on the communities closest to us in the first part. In the second part, you expand to the communities a bit farther away. Our churches, nonprofits that we interact with, our schools, government institutions, social media, uh, and then ultimately the world. Um, And I really want to drill down here because your perspective on how we interact with institutions really resonates with me so much. Uh, You write, I'll quote again, because I love to quote you. We started treating our institutions like products. When we interact with our institutions, we only have our individual needs in mind. And look, that's not a character flaw. That's what we've been trained to do as consumers. We have been trained to consume. That is the messaging we sort of take in at the highest level. Just that's the message we get over and over again, like social media, advertising, all these places. We're taught to act like a customer, like a client, like a consumer. And what we're really trying to to push people in this, this part of the book is to see themselves as participants, as citizens, as members of these institutions, and I think we write about this in the book. There's a the great moment in the Rob Bell podcast where he says, like, we are the committee. I think he's, he's quoting Chariots of Fire, the movie where everybody's like, but wait, we are the committee. Like, this is our institution. This is our church. This is our school. And I don't mean that in an ownership way because you see, you see that. You see people showing up at school board mo- meetings and, and behaving as if the school belongs to them. It sits on their shelf and they get to decide. Um, and that is so toxic and so disconnecting instead of inviting people to participate. And participation means you don't get your way every time. Participation means you're going to leave frustrated, but you're going to, you know, as Beth says, you to disagree and then commit, right? Like that's what happens sometimes. And But you have to learn that. You kind of have to put that in your cells and put that in your muscles um, and be out there in the world and, and experience that frustration and know like you can still be, you can still, you can leave a, a board meeting or an event so frustrated. I would even say in some of my experiences in life, I have left left meetings betrayed, feeling betrayed as a person. And I can still look back at my time in those institutions with gratitude and see that, yes, there was frustration and betrayal and even, you know, heartbreak but that I still learned, I still contributed, and I'm still proud of my time. Um, And I'm not, you know, I'm talking about like community institutions. Um, And I just think that that's really, really important. One of the things that makes writing a book really difficult for me, Fred, is that it is a, it is a consumer posture that people 
get a book in, right? Mm. I feel like with our podcast, uh, uh, our regular listeners know that we are not here to entertain. We are here to invite listeners into a conversation. A book goes out, and a necessary part of the book going out is saying to people, will you please write a review of the book? Mm. And just that question, just that need, changes the posture, right? And it Mm -hmm. becomes... What did I think about the book? Did it entertain me? Did it make did it make me think the way I want to? Did I like the writing style? Did, how do I feel about it? Um, which is fine and normal. And again, there's nothing wrong with it. And, and we do need people to do it, right? It's, it is an important component of trying to share the book with more people. And at the same time, that posture just fundamentally alters the experience. Mm-hmm. And I think that we are more accustomed to that posture. That's the posture we practice than one that says, what else is going on here? I have really been changed by the Nice White Parents podcast. It really helped me in concrete, tangible ways figure out how to practice what I knew to be true, to look at the school and say, actually, this isn't best for my individual kid, but I can see how it is best for the whole class. Mm -hmm. Whenever I go substitute teach, you know, I think my daughters don't need a 15-minute bathroom break, (laughs) but lots of their peers do, and getting those peers collectively through this process requires this time and this attention and these procedures, Uh, and then you just kind of step out of it, and when you start to see yourself as one part of a whole, and that the whole's needs often run counter to the individual needs, it just relieves that sense of let me be the reviewer of all experiences and helps me say what would i what would i desire in the long term for the vast majority of us here and it's it's nice i think it's really refreshing it makes you not want to be the reviewer anymore well i enjoyed being uh, a reviewer of this book uh, just as a book qua book it's uh, eminently readable as I mentioned, I have pages and pages of quotes, uh, but it's also extremely useful. And it apart's funny. Uh, we don't have to go into it now, but there is a, uh, a chapter that has the word poop in the title. You're going <laughs> to have to go read the book to find Thank out. Thank you. That's, the, that's my favorite review so far. Okay. Go, go, go read the book to find out about the poop. Um, let's switch to national politics. Sarah, I heard you um, say recently that this section might have been one of your favorites for a variety of reasons. In one way, you talk about the role of trauma uh, in our national politics. You compare it to childhood trauma and its effect on us as adults. And then you talk about our founding traumas, and that trauma leads to more polarization. Can you talk more about that? Yeah, we were really invested in saying something new and different about the polarization. I did not want to get to, we couldn't leave this level of connection out. That wouldn't have made any sense. But we didn't want to just rehash like, oh, well, party politics are broken and there's income inequality. Now, all those things are true. Um, but we did not want to, to re, sort of rehash this the same conversation. And I think what really connected for me in this section is not thinking about, you know, I think there is a role for thinking about individual trauma and the way that we carry that and hurt people hurt people but also just to put us put ourselves in the mindset of like what have we been through as a country what do, what happens when we think about the trauma we've experienced as a nation because what are we trying to do when we're addressing polarization we're trying to reconnect e- to each other through that role instead of seeing each other perpetually as enemies on the national stage what we what it, we are all sort of well some of us are desperate to do is to reconnect to each other to see that we share that identity that we are in something together and i think sometimes seeing like what we've been through together is a good way to do that and that's what we try to talk about in that trap like look what we've been through together look what we are trying to heal together look at what we like what informs our story as a country, these 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 traumas. And look, in the same way, I love that Jennifer Senior piece after 9-11 where she talks, she uses a, a very, uh, an individual family who lost their um, son and brother in 
9-11, and they, at, at the beginning of the piece, the therapist, I think, says to the mother, like, grief is a mountain, and not everybody's going to make it to the top. Like, everybody climbs at different paces. Everybody deals with it differently. And, like, that's what's so hard with national trauma, right, is, like, some people are going to deal with it by doubling down on this patriotic narrative. Some people are going to deal with it by, you know, unearthing and excavating the trauma. Um, and just, but I, what I hope that chapter does is just at least put that that frame on it so that we can see through that lens and see that it's not just our successes, it's not just our politics, it's not just our controversies that inform us as citizens and connect us as citizens, but it's also this history that we've experienced um, together as citizens, as Americans. You must have had in mind when you were writing this section the very deep controversies about the contested ground of our founding. We have, for example, 1619 Project on the one hand and the 1776 Committee uh, Mm -hmm. on the other hand. I mean, how do we find common ground when the ground itself, the original ground, is so contested? I hope that working our way there helps with that process because the ground of the story of our family is contested. And the ground of how this friendship fell apart is always going to be contested. Mm-hmm. And so I hope that that by walking through each of these levels on which we relate to other people, we can kind of see, oh, well, that's, of course it is contested. Of course we don't know everything that unfolded. Of course we're telling different stories. Of course we need different stories around this. Okay, now that we've established that, that we're just people in this dimension, too, uh, that the ground shouldn't be firmer about the origin story of this country than it is about the origin of our of our of our lives and our livelihoods. How can we sift through that together? How can we sift through what we know? It's harder uh, with these bigger shared stories because you have more voices and perspectives. You also have more agendas um, around setting what the story should be. But just le- allowing it to be a set of stories and a set of people's histories and and not just like cold, hard facts about history, but meeting those emotional needs for story that we have in every other space, I hope that that softens things enough for us to uh, hear each other work together, see the value in uh, pushing on each other's version of events a little bit. Because I think we've decided if you don't deal with trauma the way I want you to, you didn't experience it. You can definitely see that in the national narrative. And I think with, you know, we talk about the 1619 Project and the 1776 Project. And it's like what I what I hope people take away is like they're just they're trying to climb the mountain. They're just doing it in their way. And you don't like it. But that doesn't erase the fact that they're trying to work through something just because they're not working through it the way you want. Um, and to see that as as motive like they're doing something for a reason they're trying um to make sense of the world and the trauma and the intense experiences that we've had as a country in the same way you are they're just they're just doing it a different way they're using the tools available to them and sometimes the only tools are erasure and (laughs) and fear and scarcity um and control and i think what's so hard is that we ju- we have to coexist with those coping mechanisms. We have to show up for each other and understand that there 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 are still some there there has to be right. If we're going to continue on together as a country, there has to be a path forward um, in the face of those very 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 different strategies. I want to leave listeners with one more quote from this section before we turn to one of the final sections of the book, and that is, "We are attempting to grow the world's first multicultural democracy." And our moments of growth are sown with hard work, not hatred. So just imagine that uh, being said by Beth and Sarah. Uh, Global (laughs) politics. uh, We expand the circle all the way out to global politics. And so you talk about reengaging or just engaging as American citizens and connecting with each other. But you also talk about our connectedness globally. But then you say that our thinking is stuck in the boundaries of modern maps, even as the maps have changed. So how have the maps changed? It's so easy to think this this nation state setup we have has always been that way. But man, take out a globe. 
Because if you bought it at a Salvation Army, it's incorrect. <laughs> you know, like that those lines have changed. We have new countries. And maybe the, the lines themselves haven't changed everywhere in the world, but they're certainly contested lines. I mean, look, we, we wrote the obviously wrote the book before the invasion of Ukraine. And so we have this real live example of things that we believe to be permanent are not always permanent, particularly on the global stage. And I think, you know, I think some of that is informed, you know, as our from our perspective as Americans, where the lines have been pretty set for a while. I would argue for too long, and I would like to, to up in some of those lines. I would like to draw some new geographical lines in America, but I think that definitely informs it. And I think once you sort of loosen your grip on that and understand that this is, again, global politics, just like all politics, are rule, decisions and rules about how we live together. Um, and sometimes those rules are in conflict. Sometimes they're being contested um, violently and otherwise. And, you know, the maps change literally and the the landscape changes metaphorically all the time. The technology that's available to us, how we communicate with each other, what type of work we need to do to sustain ourselves. I wonder sometimes, you know, will this book need an addendum where we talk about what we owe to our fellow humans who are living in a colony on Mars? Or if we mm-hmm. were to discover humans somewhere else, what what would what would we owe to each other then? What would our duties be? What kind of citizenship would we think about if we didn't share this planet anymore? I think there would be one because the only thing I know for sure in a world where there is so little certainty is that I do think something connects all of us. Um, And so when something connects all of us, there are going to be places where we drive each other crazy, where we find um, inexplicable acts of generosity. And uh, how do we how do we navigate all of that? We'll always pose a really difficult set of questions. Uh, But I I felt it really important, especially as we talk about the globe to to really think forward, because. We can see right now how fluid, as Sarah said, the boundary lines we draw for ourselves are. I think the the way we share resources is going to have to become more fluid. The way that we move about in the world is going to have to become more fluid. And so knowing that um, exploring what we are to each other and what we owe to each other is one of the most important questions we can be asking ourselves. So stepping out uh, from the book for just a moment, are you both optimistic about the future? about our ability as Americans and as global citizens to to live in relative harmony and to solve the big problems. Fred, I have three kids. Of course, I'm optimistic. I know other people don't experience history the way I do, but when I go to a part in history and I thought, think, man, that looks like this, where we are now is a piece of cake, right? Like, we think the press is bad now. Take a trip through the late 1800s. Um, And that always kind of leaves me in a place of optimism. Like, I'm sure they felt like it was the end of the world. And it wasn't. It wasn't the end of the world. Um, They worked through it. They figured it out. Um, I think there's just a a sense to feel like our challenges are completely unique and and insurmountable. And I think I've noticed in the last just month or two that there's been a real shift, um, particularly around conversations about climate change, but in a lot of places and political spaces where people are saying it cannot, we cannot inhabit a place of hopelessness and anxiety and this sort of dumpster fire mentality. It gets, it's very dangerous. It's a dangerous way to think about politics in the world. Um, And so I I hope that that's, you know, easing up a bit and that we can, you know, inhabit some optimism and see what's coming in the future as an area of possibility, not because we're going to fix everything. Fixing is a verb we should not use when humans are involved. Um, but improvement and and continuing sort of advancement and and hopefully enlightenment <laughs> and um, you know I love humans. My listen, my money is always on humans. I can't help myself. I think optimism is necessary. I don't know what our fuel is if not optimism. Mm-hmm. When I try to really think through that, okay, what is the fuel if not optimism? I always get an answer that feels like an awful lot of subtraction. Uh, and that subtraction at some point ends in zero. And, and that's just not where I want to be. When I am sitting with people in person talking about even the hardest issues, there is always a moment when people kind of lean back and say, okay, I'm going to think about this a little bit differently. There is always an opening. And 
it just feels to me like the the work is taking those openings and celebrating those openings and continuing to walk through them so that they can over time get a little bit bigger and a little bit bigger. And the openings that I find in myself, you know, the more that I that I spend time with people and especially with our listeners who have vastly different life experiences than I have, they create openings in me and and that feels that feels good. That's the active addition that I want to live in. Well, I feel like this book is itself an opening uh, that we ought to celebrate. Uh, and I hope listeners and I hope the whole Pantsuit Politics community uh, feels the same way. Now, what? how to move forward when we're divided about basically everything. Um, Sarah and Beth, it's been an honor to oh, have this you, opportunity to, uh, to interview you on your own show. Uh, so thank you for that. Thank you thank for you. taking the wheel here, Fred. We really appreciate it. Thank you to Fred. Oh, so generous of him to come on here and do that for us. We really, really appreciate it. Speaking of generosity, we had a weekend full of generosity in Waco, Texas with Clint and Kelly Harp and all of the listeners who traveled to Texas, California, Arkansas, people came from all over. Of course, lots of Texans who we love and adore. So thank you to everyone who came to Waco. We had a fabulous time. We did. Clint Harp and Kelly Harp are the most generous hosts. They're so nice. The stupid. The most it's gracious kind of... people. Clint is funny. He did such a great job moving the show along. I just had a really good time. It's always funny when we're out doing things like this. Lots of people will say to me, are you good? Are you okay? Is this hard for you? <laughs> and I mean, it makes me tired because I am very introverted. It's a lot of peopling for me, but it's so wonderful. I mean, it's just to be able to feel people's energy and hug people and put faces and names together. Uh, it is it is a gift, and I I would do it often um, if life allowed it. Yeah, we this was our first big event since the pandemic, so it was our first chance to really see people and connect back with people. We had a VIP event where we all just ate a lot of charcuterie and hung out, and it was so fun. And it's always, I mean, one listener came up to me and said, you make me want to be a boy mom. And I just think that is the best compliment. But people mm, are always just compliment. sharing their hearts and saying, you help me see this differently. And I adore you. And you help me do this. And, you know, it's like I have like a love hangover. It was really fun to meet people's parents and spouses and friends. This funny thing happened in the VIP event. Uh, I didn't intend this, but I just kind of ended up staying at a table because that that is my way at an event to just kind of find a spot and be there. And people, I didn't even realize it was happening, formed a line to just come through and see me at this table while Sarah and Clint worked the room. Yeah, because I came in and said, hello, people, yelled real loud and then proceeded to work the room very quickly. Yeah, and that's just not me. So I so I hung out at this table. At one point, someone comes through the line, and she's there with a friend who has gone to the bathroom. But her friend is the fan of the show. She had, like, just listened to her first episode of the podcast. <laughs> and so I said, well, hi, I'm Beth. I'm one of the hosts of the show. And everybody around laughed so hard, and it was just a really fun moment. But it was great to meet some new people. One lady came to the VIP event who only knew us because she follows the Hippodrome, the place where we had it very oh, closely. Fun. And she said, I saw you on the list. I like to get out and do things. So I checked out the podcast. I really liked it. And I just thought I'd come say hi and meet you all. And it. it was great to meet new friends as well as see people like Kelly and who I think has been to every live Everyone. show we've ever done. Who's so kind. It's ridiculous. Um, just She's lots incredible. of lots of old and new friends. It was great. Yeah, we had a great time. My mom and my grandmother were there. People were like, we've heard all kinds of things from you, from your mom and grandmother. And I was like, they're lies. Don't listen to anything <laughs> they have to say. Um, no, we had a blast. Our team was amazing. Maggie rocked it. Um, Ashley, who's now just our beloved, came and helped. Um, Olivia. Y'all, she took a thousand pictures. That night we were sitting there because that night I watched my first episode of Fixer Upper Ever, Clint's episode. I'd never seen an episode. And we were in the actual harp house they do on the episode. It's such a surreal experience to watch an episode of HGTV in the home the episode is taking place in, FYI. But she, as we were watching, Olivia was like, you guys, I took a thousand pictures. <laughs> we're like, Olivia, how? How you do it? So we can't wait to start sharing those. She's incredible. She took pictures at our Los Angeles show at our first tour, and we used them so much. We we're like, would you like to come to Waco? 
And Elise did a wonderful job getting us set up for this event. I really missed Elise's um, energy at this event because Elise is really good at saying, we have to get these seven things done in the next hour and we're going to do them now. And I missed that, uh, the management that she brings to these events. And so um, it's, it's wonderful to both be with your team members and see them thriving and to kind of celebrate the gifts that Maggie and Ashley and Olivia brought and, and also to, uh, to get to miss Elise was a was a nice feeling to you know you know what I mean mm-hmm. to just appreciate like gosh we're so lucky to have the best people that we get to work with all the time and lucky to hang out with all of you and lucky to have an incredible invitation from Clinton Kelly so thank you for to everyone who made Waco a success and who came and enjoyed the event we're gonna do many more this year get excited and of course all of you are an essential part of this day the launch of our book. Thank you pre- if you have pre-ordered. Thank you for buying copies for your friends and family. We can't wait to see all of you tonight at the launch party. And until then, keep it nuanced, y'all. Pantsuit Politics is produced by Studio D Podcast Production. Elise Knapp is our managing director. Maggie Penton is our community engagement manager. Dante Lima is the composer and performer of our theme music. Our show is listener-supported. Special thanks to our executive producers. Martha Brunitsky. Allie Edwards. Janice Elliott. Sarah Greenup. Julie Haller. Helen Handley. Tiffany Hassler. Emily Holliday. Katie Johnson. Katina Zuganellis kasling Barry Kaufman. Molly Kors. The Creeps! Lori Ladau. Lily McClure. Emily Neasley. The The Hattons! Tawny Peterson, Tracy Putoff, Sarah Ralph, Jeremy Sequoia, Katie Steigers, Karen True, Annika Uveline, Nick and Elisa Valelli, Catherine Vollmer, Amy Whited, Jeff Davis, Melinda Johnston, Ashley Thompson, Michelle Wood, Joshua Allen, Morgan McHugh, Nicole Berkless, Paula Bremer, and Tim Miller. Uh, we hope everybody had the best. W- no, you say that. Let me say that again. We hope ever. We will be book. back in your ear. <laughs>